Okay, uh, welcome again. Uh, today, I want to first off start with one announcement. Uh, what was planned for this month's uh, presentation, a what went wrong, what went right in Harris County by Harris County Democratic Party Chair uh, Lily Schechter and the folks that have actually dug down deep into the numbers, because we know that, that while things were great in Harris County overall, there were some, for lack of a better word, weak spots, things that we as a party, we as uh, folks engaged in the political process need to do better to engage our voters engage on the issues that matter and drive attendance at the polls. Uh, that, that is going to be now, instead of our usual first Monday of the week, it's going to be So you'll get the announcement for next week for April 8th. That'll go out and I hope you can also join us April 8th for the announcement, uh, or I'm sorry, for the review, the deep dive into the data about what happened in Harris County. Before we start our presentation, we also have an opportunity to hear from uh, a Rice educated uh, candidate for special election in Congressional District 6 up in Terrence County, Janice Sanchez, who will share with you a little bit about this really interesting opportunity to help solidify for the next two years, the Democratic majority in the House of Representatives. Thank you. So first of all, thank you, Mike, and thank you everyone for this opportunity to introduce myself. I'm Jana Lynn Sanchez, and I'm running for Congress in the special election in Texas District 6, with mostly Tarrant County is the district. I'm from Ellis County, which is right in the middle of the district. Um, my grandparents were migrant farm workers who settled there in the 50s. Um, we grew up poor, um, and um, I was able to go to Rice thanks to great public school teachers, federal financial aid and scholarships. Um, and, um, you know, I think that we probably all share right now the belief that our democracy is at great risk, which is why I'm running. We must build a future that is equitable, prosperous, and most importantly, healthy for Texans right now. Um, the district is one that absolutely no one believed was winnable in 2018 when I ran my first campaign. Um, but we built a team with volunteers mainly, a grassroots campaign. We also actually raised more money than Ron Wright raised in 2018. We worked very hard and it was a record haul for a Democrat in that district. And by the end of the campaign, we had the support of the DCCC, of Emily's List, and I was the first Democrat in a generation to get the endorsement of the Dallas Morning News in my race in 2018. But I didn't stop after I lost. Um, I kept working. I helped organize Democrats in Tarrant County through Tarrant Together, which I co-founded with other women who ran for office that year. And you may know that it was the first year since 1976 that a Democrat presidential nominee won Tarrant County. Um, so it's very important that a lot of progress has been made, not just in Tarrant County, but across the district. The district is winnable now, and I'm the Democrat who can win it. The district went from a 12-point Trump district in 2016 to just three points in this no last past November. And of course, that was before the insurrection and before Snowmageddon. Both of those things, I think, really demonstrate to voters that Republicans have no interest and no capability of governing. Um, so we think that's why the district is very winnable. Unfortunately, it's a 23-way race. Um, there are 23 candidates, um, um, e almost equally split between Republicans and Democrats with, a, um, with an independent and a libertarian thrown in. And the top two vote getters will go on to a runoff. So my goal is to get into the top two, and that's why I need your help. I have the highest name ID across the district and um, will we'll for sure be the top Democrat. I've also, prior to even announcing, in the weekend before announcing on February 16th, I raised $100,000 over the weekend um, to launch my campaign with. And we're continuing to raise money and doing very well. Um, but I need more because it's going to be a very expensive race in a very short timeline. So I would really appreciate if people could make a donation to my campaign today. Um, we, no one's going to fight harder for you and no one is going to work harder to um, 
do, do the things that Texans need um, right now in Congress. So thank you very much and um, get in touch with me through my website. Jenna, I got one question actually. Is that guitar, are you yes. gonna do a sing off when you leave or is that just a showpiece? <laughs> Did you see my guitar? <laughs> I used to play a lot, but I don't play much anymore, I'm afraid. Okay, well, thank you very much. And, and, and we'd obviously encourage uh, uh, everybody to support your campaign that's listening, not just obviously in, in your neck of the woods, but elsewhere. Uh, Steve Dubel's already put the campaign link in there. Thank you very much for joining us thank today you. and good luck on your race. Uh, thank so now, you. Thank you, John. So at this point, uh, I wanna introduce the first uh, panelist or the first fellow to talk. In looking at it and in talking to folks like Barbara Nowski and, and, and people that have really delved into this before, I was struck by how back in 1999, when I was involved in some lobbying for the trial lawyers, that was also when the electricity deregulation battle and the largest, most well attended uh, of the uh, hearings, the committee hearings, were all my friends when I started Vincent Elkins who were hanging out with the Enron folks at the committee hearings on designing what we have now in place. One of the things that, that stood out to me from this is there's certainly a lot of talk about who was running PUC, who was running Urquhart, you know, what they knew, when they knew it, why they were doing it. But pretty quickly it became clear, and Ed Hurst is really someone who's been there from the beginning, among his many claims to fame besides the fact that he's been teaching at U of H and studying these issues is, as I understand it, he actually turned down an offer from Enron to help design the system. And in many ways, the opposite of pro bono is that phrase, qui bono, who benefits? Why this happened, how it happened, where you have a situation where, as we're gonna hear, and, and please make sure you put your questions in, because I know a lot of us have a lot of questions. This was not an accident, this was not a mistake. We have a system that in large part is designed for a very few to make a lot of money, a couple times a, a day, a couple days during the summer, a couple days during the winter. And the fact that that riding too close to the rails for those motives can explain a lot of issues. And this is a situation where, as we'll hear from Representative Rosenthal, it's really a good time not just to look at who's driving the car, but look under the hood and see what's going. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Hurst. We appreciate the chance for you to, to uh, spend time with us. And let me turn it over to you. Oh, my, my pleasure, Mike. And let me get the, the picture right and I'll be... Uh, I'll be set for Harold here. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm just going to kind of do a brief history of, of, of how we got here, how I, how I saw this uh, uh, develop. Um, you know, historically, uh, the electric utilities were vertically integrated. Everybody was, was terribly afraid of, of Thomas Edison and uh, uh, Westinghouse in New York City as they began to run wires around the city. And it became a, a, a public interest to make sure that we didn't have a multitude of wires on the, on the street, a uh, multitude of connections, uh, disparate uh, electricity systems. Um, you know, even, even, even into the 70s, there was direct current in New York City, uh, in, in actually in uh, buildings next to Grand Central Station. Uh, so 12 volt lighting throughout a hotel, for example. Um, and it became a matter of public policy to, to restrict these monopolies. And we began to regulate them on, a, on an allowed rate of return on the, on the capital base. Over time, uh, the utility executives and, and the shareholders you know, guaranteed a rate of return. The only way they could actually increase uh, their, their revenues uh, was to build an ever larger capital plant. And so uh, I'm, I'm sure there are a number of you who, who handled hearings before the different public utility commissions or public service commissions. And, you know, some of my instructors uh, made a healthy living uh, justifying uh, new plants and, and taking apart different rate-based uh, arguments. And so electric utilities are regulated from the generator all the way through to the meter. Um, in, in the mid seventies, uh, uh, following a speech by President Ford to the Chamber of Commerce, uh, my old, old professor and, and mentor, Paul McAvoy began to investigate the deregulation of different industries, the regulated ones, the um, his story about going to the 
the head of the Teamsters Union was, was quite charming. And eventually this got around to electric utilities. Uh, California took the way, uh, took the lead with the uh, Assembly Bill um, 18, 1890 and 1993 uh, and implemented it in 1996. Uh, 2000, 2001, of course, we had the, the California electricity market debacle. And that was, that was where, for example, uh, Enron took the, the electricity at nine cents a kilowatt hour that it had bought and then flipped it back at 22 cents a kilowatt hour uh, to the California market and cleaned up you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. You know, very similar to what George Soros did when he broke the uh, Bank of England uh, earlier in the 80s. Uh, Texas had begun this process in the late 90s, as Mike said, and, and uh, uh, no one really seemed to pay much attention to the California uh, uh, example. So, you know, we, we had uh, implemented under, under Perry the uh, electricity only market that we have today with, uh, within ERCOT. And so ERCOT, the, the Electric Reliability Council of Texas, um, has two functions in, in Texas. Number one, it manages the electrons, the flow of electrons um, you know, from one, one node to another. And it also acts on the, the financial side, the marketing side, the economic side. It is a, a market maker. It is a clearinghouse, uh, a New York Stock Exchange specialist, if you will, uh, the equivalent of an exchange. And so it has two, two functions and um, it failed uh, spectacularly at both, I think, uh, two weeks ago. So uh, as, as this process began in the late 90s, uh, folks went to Austin and said, look, your, your generation plant is, is overly built. I mean, some plants are sitting over here that are only operating two or three weeks out of the year, but you're paying for them uh, all, all 52 weeks out of the year. Um, and so, you know, smart MBAs, we, we understand that uh, with diminishing returns, a, you know, that last one or two percent of, of reliability, that six sigma, if you will, uh, can cost almost as much as that first 80, 85 percent of reliability. And so they, they began to, to make a move towards cheap over reliable. Um, and this appeal, you know, the generation plant probably was overbuilt at that time, uh, but but still, we had had reasonably reliable um, electricity, and uh, so it was separated into the the generator segment, uh, the transmission lines, uh, the local distribution companies such as Encore and um, CenterPoint, and then and then the resellers, the marketers, the the guys who essentially are, are selling. Uh, electrons on the street corner, uh, Westheimer and Post Oak, you know, I've got a bundle of electrons, that guy's got a bundle of electrons and electrons and electrons, you know, it's anyway. Uh, and so as this, this developed in the, the early uh, 2000s, we kind of ran to uh, this period where uh, uh, natural gas was very expensive natural gas peaker plants were built. And then as we got to uh, uh, 08 through 11, the price of natural gas fell dramatically. And these, these peaker plants transitioned into baseload plants at the expense of, of the, you know, the longstanding coal baseload facilities. And, and we, we entered a period of where uh, uh, revenues for generators was less than their total cost of providing electricity. Uh, we, we reached a period where the, the rates of return, the economic value added went to zero and went negative. And this happens frequently in markets that are, are partially deregulated. Uh, our market is, is not a, a deregulated market. It is just regulated differently. If I were to tell you that the speed limit on I-10 uh, tomorrow is uh, uh, lifted. Uh, I would stand up and call it a, a deregulated I-10, but you know it's still constrained by the physical uh, characteristics of, of, of the interstate and, and also of course by the weather. And as we, as we look at the Texas market, you know, in today's terms, everybody knows that 
peak demand is going to be in August. That's roughly 75 gigawatts. Uh, on average across the year, 45 gigawatts is demand. So in an electricity only market, we know that 30 gigs is sitting on the sideline, not making any money. Uh, you know, the analogy I use is, is if the Astros were paid on an electricity only basis, only those 10 guys who take the field would be the ones actually getting paid for that day. And the other guys on the bench, um, you know, have no incentive really to get into the game. And that's kind of how we wound up in this winter time issue. Uh, uh, if, if they're not getting revenues, if they're not covering their cost, if they're, they're not being compensated for winterizing, then they don't do it. Uh, nine years out of 10, they don't need to because of the temperate winters that we have. But in 89, 2011, and this year, uh, it would have been really great if, if, if they had, had planned ahead for this. Um, you know, looking ahead, uh, we've got some real serious problems because our grid is, is inadequate to the task of, of taking care of, of Texas demand. 2011, we had um, uh, the uh, polar vortex. Uh, ERCOT kicked off with uh, uh, they're euphemistically called load shedding events. The rest of us call these blackouts. Uh, lots of people seem to remember the fact that they blacked out Arlington Stadium before the Super Bowl. Um, those paying attention notice that they blacked out the Dallas Medical Center with tragic results for some patients. Um, lots of hearings. The North American uh, Electric Reliability Corporation came in, issued a 347 page report all sorts of recommendations. Um, these were you know, put in the back of a file cabinet at some point. Uh, ERCOT is the traffic cop, you know, really doesn't have any enforcement ability, uh, has no mandate to require investment, can't make investment. Uh, the Public Utility Commission is, is, has been you know, historically uh, over the last 20 years, uh, uh, very hands-off. Um, unable or unwilling or both uh, to, to implement uh, regulatory uh, requirements and, and certainly uh, unable to, to penalize uh, bad behavior or behavior that may be say counter to uh, uh, the interest of, of Texans. Uh, as I looked at it post 2011 and saw that nothing was going on, you know, we wrote our little piece in 2013 that, that called out the, the ERCOT market is essentially a replication of an old fashioned Soviet bureau. Uh, ERCOT facing generating companies is just the one buyer. So very much like the company town. This is why we have unions. Um, the, the, the generators would bid in and bid in as, at, a, at a price that was less than their cost of providing electricity. Um, this, this of course would lead to a lack of reinvestment. It would lead to a lack of new capacity coming online over time. Um, we looked at the, the, the parallels with the, the, the old Soviet central planning model that Kantorovich had done. And uh, when, when he received the Nobel, he pleaded that he was just a physicist and that he wasn't the, the, the father of Soviet central planning, but that was his job within, within the Soviet Union. Um, you know, these, these one-dimensional, two-dimensional models, a spreadsheet works just fine on paper, but when it meets the real world and becomes, becomes multi-dimensional, uh, very nodal, um, uh, first, second, third, fourth order impacts make a huge difference. And we, and we kind of heard that uh, with, with CEO Magnus' testimony, where he, he talked about planning for you know, a 95% uh, confidence interval on, on the weather and how they could respond at ERCOT. And then it was just numbers. You know, electricity, the value of electricity is not the cost of the electricity, not the cost of generating the electricity. It's, it's in what it allows us to do. The, the uh, uh, opportunity cost of, of healthcare, health and safety, uh, food, uh, uh, traffic control, lights went out, uh, dozens of people have died and the, and the toll's not quite known yet. 
um, the, the, the value of lost load is just not a number in an ERCOT or NERC study. It is, it is the, the confidence in society and, and society's infrastructure um, that, that they congratulated themselves on not allowing the entire grid to go down is, is a frightening disclosure that the Texas grid is, is extremely vulnerable. Uh, if, if it would take weeks and months to restart the grid from a black start as, as they testified uh, before the legislature, you know, this is, this is unacceptable. Uh, the, the Northeast grid went down because a tree fell in Cleveland and most of that was back within 24 hours and all of it by 48. Um, when uh, a technician in Arizona flipped the switch and surged a, 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 an overload across Arizona and Southern California, that grid was brought up from a, a complete black start to operational in uh, less than 24 hours. You know, Magnus' testimony last week was was very disturbing for the state of the grid for Texas. Um, that that Elon Musk was tweeting from his car in the garage in Austin about lack of reliability. This is this is a black eye for industry. Who's going to want to move to Texas because uh, you know we just can't keep the lights on. Um, and so as as I as I look at it, the structure for the the ERCOT market actually lends itself to wanting to gain the market to a short squeeze, if you will. Everybody's familiar with the you know, GameStop here a couple of weeks ago. Well, that's, that's how the ERCOT market has been gained. In 2014, uh, one of the generators gained the market so much that the independent market monitor called them out, said, you know, these guys have walked off with $300 million off the top of the market. You know, there's no penalty for that sort of behavior in ERCOT. Um, uh, and there, there are multiple other instances uh, over the years, but in, 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 the, you know, the, in, the, in the paradigm of, of, of pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered, um, 50 billion changing hands, at least the nominal value of that, the week of February 14th, you know, that, that kind of qualifies under uh, that, that sort of, of uh, umbrella. Um, the, the gaming portion, market power, uh, when can you actually swing the market in your favor? Uh, and with ERCOT facing the customer as a monopolist, facing the, the generator as a monopsonist, and, and then unilaterally setting prices is, I think, a real uh, uh, conundrum that the legislature and the, and the governor need to address. Uh, um, giving someone a blank check to, to just sit there and start spending your money uh, with, without any particular oversight, without any accountability uh, is uh, uh, unfortunately not, you know, exactly what happened in this case. Um, and, and this type of behavior will continue because since there are no penalties for this sort of behavior, I mean, just like Enron, Enron walked out of the California market with hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, it looks like a number of, of parties will be walking out of the Texas market, perhaps billions of dollars from the activities of a couple of weeks ago. And you know, think of John Nash, a beautiful mind and, and, and game theory and the theory of non-cooperative behavior, you know, the prisoner's dilemma. Um, those of you who do antitrust, think of, of the concept of, of tacit collusion. Um, you know, we're going to find out an awful lot in the uh, uh, postmortem that that is you know quite likely to go on for for months and perhaps years. Um, so, what do we need to do? I think uh, uh, at this point, and I, this is just kind of a developing discussion for me. Uh, we need to do something about the Public Utility Commission. Um, uh, certainly not independent. I mean, as, as everyone knows in Texas, there's no conflict of interest. But we have a model right across the Red River with the Oklahoma Corporations Commission. Uh, they regulate absolutely everything from, from lemonade stands to, to oil wells, gas wells, and the grid. Uh, very independent. They take two oaths of office. They take an oath of office, um, uh, just like any public official would in Oklahoma. But then they take a second oath saying that they won't be conflicted. They won't have an economic interest in anything they regulate. Um, so when the earthquakes from the disposal of frack water 
uh, began to be an issue uh, a couple of years ago. The, the Oklahoma Corporations Commission had a decision and banned the practice pretty much in two weeks. Here with the Railroad Commission, we're still kind of thinking about it and studying it. And, you know, maybe that sort of independent uh, analysis is uh, an independent uh, oversight is, is required and, and applying that to our grid, which is so necessary to maintain the, the, the integrity of, of the fabric of society is uh, uh, one of the ways we need to go. So I will, uh, I will uh, uh, step back and, and handle any questions you've, you've got to have. Um, Thanks, Ed. We're going to handle the questions at the end, but the one thing I do know, which which is always a great sign, is we've got tons of questions for you. Uh, so obviously, you've 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 done what what we hoped you would do is is get out there and talk about the issues that 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 need to be addressed, not just the surface level. Uh, thank you, Ed. And, and now I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn it over to our Harris County attorney, the youngest, best dressed county attorney we've had in at least ever, uh, Christian Menifee who's gonna to talk to us about some of the issues that he's already with his office addressing, as well as kind of his thoughts about what he's seeing from the first uh, go through uh, right now in the last several weeks on it. Thank you again, uh, County Attorney Christian Menifee for joining us. Uh, thank you, Mike, I really appreciate the introduction uh, and, and the comment about being best dressed. I was told to uh, control the things that you can control. Um, so if I put on a suit every day, everything else will be all right. Um, thank you all for having me here today. I'm Christian Menifee, the Harris County Attorney. I'm sure many of the folks here have no clue what that title is. Uh, our, my position is effectively the Chief Civil Lawyer for the county, and of course, Harris County is the largest county in Texas. Uh, this position is different from county attorney offices in, in other counties in Texas because we have a specific statute which gives us the legal right and the legal duty to represent Harris County government in all civil matters. And of course, because it's an elected position, there's also some overlay of having a greater obligation uh, to the people of Harris County. But an important point for our conversation here today, because we're a county, we're effectively a local arm of the state. So we're constrained in what we can do on certain issues. And you know, uh, given the state leaders right now, they remind us of that uh, quite often. I'm gonna talk about just kind of you know, briefly what we have going on here in Harris County in response to the winter storm and the power debacle uh, that spawned from it. I, I saw some conversation in the chat about uh, you know, some of the higher level stuff that maybe folks aren't getting uh, because our first speaker is just you know, incredibly intelligent on these issues. But if you're anything like me, uh, all you knew Monday morning was that your power went out at 3 a.m. And, and you're wondering why and what happened. Uh, so in the initial days of the storm and the power debacle and then the things that spawned after it, you know, we were doing a bunch of research to immediately get smart on the issues and try to figure out what the low hanging fruit was. Especially important to us is because we have the legal duty to represent Harris County in all civil matters, that also means that we can bring lawsuits on behalf of Harris County for damage done to the county. Uh, but at the same time, there are private litigants, of course, who are kind of watching to see what information we put out to decide how to approach their cases as well. And some of the major issues we saw early on was that, of course, Texas's grid is, is separate and essentially disconnected from the other two grids. So that means in most instances, there are extreme limitations on importing supply from other grids in the country uh, when our demand exceeds our supply and, and exporting supply to other states when our supply exceeds our demand. Um, one of the initial issues that we had here was, of course, the winterization issue, just trying to better understand it. Um, I, as politicians do, as soon as I got smart on a couple of issues, uh, tweeted out something about how we were in this position because uh, ERCOT and the power generators had failed to properly plan. And I come from, um, I, I worked at a law firm out here and then worked at another large law firm. And so I, I had been on the industry side for some time. So I was immediately flooded with text message from folks at various power generation companies who were at this point, and this was early in the storm, taking the position that they had done absolutely nothing wrong and in fact, it was on the fuel suppliers who were responsible for getting the fuel to the power generation plant so that they can churn out the power uh, because they had compressors at their facilities that had frozen. But as we learned from the testimony, I'll get to this in a second, at the house, uh, that is simply not true. So what we saw early on was the types of damage, of course, uh, property damage from, from pipes busting. We had essential facilities here in Harris County that were without power for some time, uh, in an extended period of time in many instances, of course, there were deaths from hypothermia, carbon monoxide deaths, and, and physical injury to folks 
as a result of the bursting pipes and, and the flooding. And these were issues that we were, again, trying to get smart on immediately so we could determine how best to tackle them. And then the elephant in the room the entire time was uh, this 2011 investigation that Mr. Hurst alluded to earlier, which was an instance where there was a hard freeze. I mean, it looks substantially similar to what happened in this last instance. There was a hard freeze. Texas didn't have enough supply to meet demand, so there were rolling blackouts. And then FERC, NERC, partnered with other regulatory bodies and came in and conducted an investigation into ERCOT's decisions in doing the rolling blackouts. And, and what they concluded was a few things, but the things that we kind of jumped out at us immediately was that FERC concluded that the cold weather was to blame for most of the loss of power, but ERCOT should have increased reserve levels going into that winter event. So again, uh, increased reserve levels was something that we had saw early and, and we saw it in this report. And so it, it kind of started raising questions for us about whether this same issue was at play here currently. And then importantly, FERC also concluded that ERCOT's winterization procedures, and this is a quote, were either insufficient or not sufficiently followed. Uh, so we knew that there would likely be some litigation spawning against ERCOT, uh, but there are all kind of hurdles to that, which I'll talk about in a second. Immediately, the PUC, the legislator, and the Attorney General's office all announced investigations. Uh, we also here in Harris County announced our own investigation pursuant to our authority to, to bring civil claims on behalf of Harris County. And so our first two steps, one was to tune in to the testimony that was happening at the hearings. Uh, two was to begin working on document requests to some of these companies. And I'll add in a third step. Uh, was to get in communication with the Attorney General's office, which had already sent out civil investigative demands to these companies uh, to receive documents. And frankly, I was shocked at the testimony that we heard at the hearings. I mean, you always see at the national level, these major disasters where large corporations did something wrong. And typically they'll go before Congress and um, you know hold the line to the very end. Of course, everybody remembers with, with the hearings on um, from the tobacco companies, about how nicotine is not addictive, right? Holding out to the very end. But I was shocked to see how the power generation companies uh, specifically went in and provided some pretty alarming admissions right out the gate. And it may be because the conclusions were unavoidable given what we know about 2011 um, and given just how massive of a failure this was, but I was pretty surprised to hear. So for example, there was testimony from a CEO of one of the power generation companies who, when he was, he first called the entire thing a colossal disaster of industry, um, and that's a quote. And then he went on to list the the folks or the entities who were involved in this process who had likely dropped the ball. And he named the PUC, ERCOT, the fuel suppliers, the power generators, and the utilities. So that is effectively everyone involved in the process. Um, and and of course, some lawsuits began spawning soon thereafter. Um, and it was sort of reaffirming for the fact that, as I mentioned with my tweet previously, uh, they're actually one of the people who had texted me, the company that this person was from, their CEO also testified that they had two facilities that had failed to properly winterize. Uh, so everybody was admitting fault across the table. And I think that there's some really good things uh, in, in that testimony that would be helpful for litigation uh, moving forward. We early on got we'll start looking through the filings in the Panda Power case. So in short, this is a lawsuit uh, from an industry actor against ERCOT. It was filed in 2016. And there, a company called Pow Panda Power argued that ERCOT had made false statements in public reports and private investment meetings about the projected long-term scarcity of the power supply and that those statements had fraudulently induced the company to spend billions of dollars on new power. And the reason why it jumped on our radar was because ERCOT was arguing that it was entitled to sovereign immunity. And again, if you're like me and you're thinking of this from a legal perspective and you don't really have any industry expertise in power electricity in general, the first thought is, well, I thought we deregulated the market. And one, and two, I thought that there was already a governmental entity that was in charge of overseeing the private entity ERCOT that manages all this. So how can it be that both the PUC and ERCOT would be entitled to sovereign immunity? And some of the arguments that ERCOT made in their briefing, it's actually before the state Supreme Court right now, um, were pretty bizarre. They argued that because they're effectively acting in a regulatory role, they're immune from suit. And even though they don't receive any public funding, even though there already is a governmental entity with the PUC that is managing or supposed to be managing or overseeing the entire process, they're still entitled separately to sovereign immunity. And that was alarming to us for the main reason that, as many of you know, under the Texas Torts Claims Act, there's 
pretty limited instances where you can bring claims against a governmental unit for property damage, um, and namely like when a, a motor vehicle is involved. And so, you know, for the state Supreme Court to rule in favor of ERCOT here and, and hold that they're entitled to immunity could have a huge impact on litigation spawning from Winter Storm Uri uh, moving forward. So right now we're, we're assessing all the issues in that case and considering filing an amicus brief. Um, because as we see it, there are many different tiers of, of entities that act pursuant to the sovereign, including local government corporations, which are explicitly made immune under statute and are funded by public tax dollars. And then beneath that is economic development corporations, which the state Supreme Court has held are not entitled to immunity. So there's some interesting issues that could have uh, a very important impact. I suspect though, now that all of this has happened and now that reform is on the agenda, at the state ledge, what you'll see is that the court will wait to rule on this um, until they see whether the issue of immunity is going to be addressed by the legislator. There's already been litigation that has spawned from what happened uh, in the power debacle. There, the lawsuits are primarily against ERCOT and utilities, and I think I saw one against a power generation company. The claims tend to be the same, negligence and gross negligence, which is based on theories of failure to warn, failure to winterize, and of course, just generally failure to prepare for these things given what these companies in the industry knew back in 2011. And then one creative argument that we've seen in one uh, filing was a, a takings claim that the rolling blackouts were taking. And I suspect that part of the reason why that argument was stopped that way is to get around this sovereign immunity issue that I just mentioned. Um, I'll, I'll wrap up quickly with some consumer, consumer protection issues that we saw spawning from this whole ordeal. Uh, the Attorney General's Office has filed a Deceptive Trade Practices Act lawsuit against Gritty. I'm sure every single person in the chat room right now has heard of Gritty. Uh, they were a retail provider and they promoted themselves as buying power uh, on the spot market, but passing on the wholesale price uh, for a low fee of $9.99 is, is how they uh, marketed it. Uh, but the argument there is basically that when they were advertising the services that they provided, they were effectively charging that $10 fee and they were passing on the prices of the market, but they weren't warning folks of the great likelihood that the prices could skyrocket. And if they did skyrocket, how meaningful of an impact that would be for consumers. And you know, the lawsuit talks about how back in 2019, there was a heat wave. And during that time, the PUC issued an order allowing ERCOT to bump prices up to $9,000 per megawatt hour, just as we saw here during Winter Storm Uri. And I believe Gritty lost something like 20% of its customer base during that time period, because when they got their bills, they were several thousand dollars. Uh, but you know, the lawsuit details how on their website, it was, it showed all kinds of, of uh, deceptive advertising about wholesale prices and about how the prices that they provided were on average uh, cheaper than what folks would normally get. But what was most interesting about Gritty's practices is they had a practice of auto debiting from folks account on a daily basis. So during the winter storm, if you had a day of $1,200 uh, worth of electricity because prices had been bumped up, then they would debit it that day. And so some folks, you know, in a week may have lost their entire savings uh, based on the actions that Gritty was taking. We, of course, in the county attorney's office got real aggressive on price gouging and, uh, you know, going after folks who were selling food, fuel, water at an excessive price. But uh, that's probably not really relevant to what we're talking about here. But what we found was kind of interesting is under the Deceptive Trade Practices Act, lawsuits like the Gritty lawsuit and really any type of price gouging case the attorney general's office is the only entity in the entire state of Texas that has the ability to go after these companies for penalties. So my office could not sue Gritty for penalties, only the AG's office uh, can. And so we had some interesting discussions earlier this week when I went to the Capitol to testify about the act, about trying to create some sort of shared authority so that local governments can, can file these types of lawsuits without having to involve uh, the AG's office. Um, and there's you know, some policy reasons for doing it like that. But effectively, we are knee deep in investigating the issues and trying to see what we can find out to determine whether it makes sense to file lawsuits on behalf of Harris County. And, and you know, part of that is going, trying to get initial document discovery from these, these companies, but also tuning into what's going on at the state and trying, where possible, to partner with the Attorney General's office, understanding that I and the other folks in Harris County were elected to serve people in Harris County. So that's our primary focus. Uh, but thank you all very much for inviting me. I look forward to taking questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Medifee. And I knew, I, I think we all anticipated you would be as aggressively engaged in this. And, and that's an amount, incredible amount of work to do in a, a short time. We will have questions, but I got one that just occurred to me. 
when you were trying to get a hold of the attorney general's office, did that include the five days when attorney general Paxton was in Utah during this whole mess? Yeah, so that, that's exactly right. Now, I will say, you know, there are some great folks in the attorney general's office that we work very well with, and we've been able to partner on some meaningful things and, and help folks in Harris County. But yeah, you know, part of the issue of having to get permission to do stuff is, you know, people may be out of pocket. And, and I heard testimony from the AG's office out in Austin about how they were working from their cars. Some of us were working from our cars or relatives house. So everybody was kind of out of pocket. But yeah, that, that exact time period was when we were ramping up our price gouging efforts. So you just need to call Park City and the Slopes rather than the folks in the AG's office. No so comment. Thank, no comment. Thank you. All right. Well, now we have the fellow that, that among others in our legislature has the responsibility for fixing this entire mess uh, right now. Uh, and, and that's an overstatement, of, of course. But, but I think uh, for those of you that haven't had a chance to, to learn about Representative Rosenthal, he's one of only two engineers in the legislature, and he's the only mechanical engineer. So as far as kind of understanding how systems work, design systems, things are put together, uh, explaining and understanding what's what's out there, how things might be reconfigured in a way that that ultimately benefits consumers and Texans and not just a few folks uh, is right up his alley. And we're very happy to have him share his thoughts and what he's already discovered and what he's looking at in terms of fixes with his fellow members of the legislature right now. Thank you, Representative Rosenthal, for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, and uh, and I'm I'm really pleased to be engaged uh, in conversation on this topic right now. Uh, it's it, it's so my name is John Rosenthal, and I am the only mechanical engineer in the entire Texas State Assembly. Uh, most of most of my the vast bulk of my engineering career has been in the oil and gas industry, and and most people don't know the specifics of what I have done. I I worked in. I'm a systems engineer. So that entails mathematical modeling of systems on one side, but on the other side, it's the development, at least later in my career, I was in charge of uh, the engineering teams that developed large scale subsea production systems. And the reason that I bring that up is because that is the business of moving hydrocarbons through cold pipes sitting on the ocean floor. And that's gonna be a core issue here. And I'll get into that in a second. Um, I've seen some questions in the chat, but before I before I address those, uh, I do want to give kind of my overall view. So I'm I'm not an expert on like markets and pricing structure, and I'm I'm very clear that those need to change. And I've I've filed drafts for legislation in that area. Uh, maybe uh, for sure, Ed Hers knows a lot more about the markets and stuff that I do. But I am I am. Um, uniquely positioned to, to understand a systemic failure, a cascading failure that occurred. So I watched almost the entire 25 hours of the, of the House hearings. We had a joint committee hearing where they brought, you know, <clears throat> electric provider executives, you know, CEO of uh, Encore and Centerpoint came and, um, and they had the Railroad Commission uh, 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 chairwoman Chrissy Craddock, and they and they had these two the chairs from the Public Utility Commission and ERCOT, um, who uh, uh, have obviously made a name for themselves at this point. And uh, and a lot of folks pointed fingers at other people. Um, nobody willing to address the the core issue of <clears throat> of a cascade failure. So. Uh, the pipeline people and the gas, you know, Texoga, Texas Oil and Gas Association folks, they claim that their gas was available. It came out of the wellheads. Wellheads didn't freeze. Pipes didn't freeze. And if they had only been provided enough electricity to run the pumps that move the gas through the pipes, they would have been fine. You know, so they claim they got cut off. Uh, <clears throat> and the electric generators claim that their generators were working fine until the gas stopped flowing. You know, uh, thermal generation fired um, uh, uh, fired by natural gas is a large portion of what supplies energy to the Texas grid. And it was the largest portion of the energy shortfall that we had. So um, it, it, the false narratives about, about windmills or the fact that 
gas was not the problem or electric generation was not the problem. The, the truth, the undeniable truth is the entire grid went down and it was a cascade failure. So uh, I have, do not have patience for a chicken or the egg conversation. Was it the gas that failed or the electricity that failed? Truth of the matter is the reliability on uh, is hinged on both of those things working. If either one fails, it causes a cascade problem. You know, gas goes offline, electricity starts dropping off, electricity starts dropping off, more gas facilities go offline. So this is, this is like the fundamental part of addressing the reliability of the system. And, and for engineers, we talk about availability because it's, it's quantifiable. You can say something is reliable or not reliable, that's more rhetoric. Availability means it is up and running a specific amount of the time. Like a typical subsea system, we want that to be flowing between 98 and 99% of the time. Uh, the other one or 2% should be planned maintenance so you can cycle it, you know. All right, so you get the idea. So what do we do about this? Uh, I filed bills in a number of areas. So one is uh, we want accountability. So one of the things is people were pointing fingers at each other, right? You have the gas people saying, well, if I had electricity, my gas would have flowed. And you have the electric people saying, if I had gas, my electric would have flowed. Well, somebody needs to be responsible for that. Uh, and that somebody really is the Public Utility Commission for the state of Texas and, uh, and their grid operator, whoever they choose it to be right now, it's ERCOT. Um, the narrative that was forwarded early on by the Public Utility Commission saying that they didn't have authority over ERCOT is garbage. It is written in statute and it's written in bylaws of both organizations. The uh, ERCOT shall, thou shalt, uh, respond to the Public Utility Commission. Public Utility Commission is responsible to vet and hire them. They install their board members. They could completely disband them. They could use somebody else. They have complete authority over ERCOT. Um, the Public Utility Commission, the commissioners are appointed by the governor of Texas. So for the people who are asking about the responsibility chain, the accountability chain of this, it starts with the legislature because this uh, Texas legislature writes the laws by which these uh, entities operate. You, the executive branch appoints the commissioners who are in charge of uh, interpreting and enforcing those laws. And then of course, you've got your operator who's responsible for the processes and procedures by which um, all that's carried out. So the first thing to do <laughs> is to create an accountability structure so that an entity or entities are directly responsible for the coordination of all this stuff, right? <clears throat> so I saw somebody had uh, asked about legislation filed. Uh, I've got a half a dozen bills that are in draft. So if you follow me, you'll see a bunch of those things. I would also file, a call, I would also, sorry, follow a colleague of mine named Lyle Larson from San Antonio, who's a conservative Republican with very astute forward thinking ideas and a very clear eyed uh, vision of what has happened. He's already filed a bill to make those public utility commissioners um, uh, elected positions rather than appointed by the governor. So that would at least make them accountable to you, the people. Uh, and also for weatherization, I, I do prefer to use the term weatherization instead of winterization because it's gotta cover all the bases. So that's one, the accountability. Second is the reliability. We do need to weatherize this system. It does need to be more reliable. And there are things that we can do about that, like uh, integrate ourselves with the rest of the country's grid. The operators in the areas that are integrated with uh, uh, the federal interconnects didn't have near the problem that the Texas ERCOT grid had. And people can argue up and down about regulation and they can bitch and whine and complain all they want to. Those are the facts. In El Paso on the Western Interconnect, they had a dozen houses lose power for one day. That was their impact from this storm. So do not talk to me about you don't want to do that at whatever cost. Weatherizing the system is not a massive cost. I'm an expert on that and I'm happy to advise them. But we need to create an unambiguous statute to make them do that. So we want them accountable. We want them reliable, answer to the people of Texas. And then um, there's, some, there's some other legislation. Uh, I think that the board members of both of those 
uh, organizations, the grid operator and the utility commission should reside in Texas. I've forwarded the idea of making that a constitutional amendment. So we'll see that. You'll see the file bills by um, Lyle Larson. I saw a I saw a comment, a question in the chat about uh, Centerpoint, how they chose the neighborhoods to black out. So this is, it's, it's actually supposed to be done using an algorithm. It's, it's computer driven and decided in advance. And that's how the neighborhoods that are close to the vital facilities, things like hospitals and fire departments, those are the pieces of the grid that they have to maintain. And then there's an algorithm for rolling the blackouts that obviously didn't work. They had to freeze that in process. But I don't think, I actually honestly don't think that that was intentional decision-making. And the last comment I want to address that I saw in this chat before, um, before we move on to the next person or questions or whatever we're gonna do is the thing about ERCOT claiming sovereign immunity as a regulator and then claiming they don't have authority to regulate. They can't have it both ways. I agree with Mr. Cargus. And, and lastly, I just want to give props to Mr. Christian Menifee. I got I just love it when someone shows up having done their homework and that dude knows more than any lawyer I know. So great job, Christian. And uh, and I'll take questions uh, along with the others. Thank you, Representative. I, I actually, I got one to start off with. Are you really telling me you, you, you have people that don't deny undeniable facts and don't want to have it both ways? Well, I'm a realist. I, I like to call myself a pragmatic progressive, but in the engineering world, you know, quite frankly, if your stuff don't work, you get fired. So uh, I'm not, I don't, I'm not into political rhetoric. I'm into making stuff work. And I, I can tell you right now, I've got stuff on the ocean floor has been functioning for 20 plus years and it's been reliable. So I know how to make stuff work. Thank you, Representative. Uh, we have a brief comment by uh, James Cargus, who's actually got some direct involvement. As a matter of fact, he's trying to work on and has been a solar generating operation in Acres Home uh, as kind of a, a land yap. He wasn't announced, but he's going to add a little bit before we turn it over to questions. And like I said, we've got lots of questions for everybody. Thank you again, Representative. We'll come back to you at the end. Thank you. Go ahead, uh, uh, James. There you go. Um, can you hear me? So James Carr, I just want to add a few um, points to what was said already. Because this is a continuing legal education course, I'll put it in terms of causation. And also because it's a democratic organization, I want to frame some of the issues about our values and our goals. Um, so pay attention, Tasso, so I'll get to your question. Uh, as stated in my Washington Monthly article, the blackout was primarily a human failure in my view. Uh, Professor Hears gave a great history of Senate Bill 7 in 2002. Um, I happen to like the energy only market that we have here in Texas. Um, and let me talk about two particular points here. First, because monopolies were broken up and generation was open up to all, renewables like wind and solar could compete for the very first time. The, uh, today, Texas is the sixth largest producer of wind power in the world. We produce twice as much as California. Um, solar power is quickly catching up in Texas with projects like mine, which is a solar farm actually planned not in Acres Homes, but in the Sunnyside neighborhood. Um, secondly, because monopolies were broken up and retail choice exists, I can choose to have power from my home be 100% renewable. Uh, this is important because Wall Street Journal ran an article, a story about how deregulated Texans are paying more for power than the 15% of Texans who remain subject to monopolies like Austin Power. People like me choose to pay more. That's not an anomaly. Um, so as lawyers, I think you understand the importance of linking the harm. Senate Bill 7, in my view, did not cause the blackout. Um, John Rosenthal and I have discussed some tweaks that are needed, but the cause was not uh, the dere dere deregulation breaking up of monopolies. Um, and if I think that reversing Senate Bill 7 and going back to monopoly power will hurt the renewable industry and allow coal and fossil fuel fuels to regain their former dominance. Um, now let's pivot a little bit and talk politics. Hang on, James, and I apologize. It's only because we're 
we've had a lot of interest. Uh, so I can I give you one more minute, please? Because I want to yeah, make sure- you I, just, well, I just want to pivot quickly to politics because when we talk about blaming the system, uh, we're letting the current elected and appointed officials off the hook. Um, when we say the system is flawed, we're admitting the current elected and appointed officials did what they could, but because of structural flaws, they're not responsible. No, the title of my arco is very deliberate. The Texas is run by Republicans. They must own this disaster. Um, and so as Democrats, I think we need to put uh, Democrats into these positions and show voters what energy leadership looks like. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, looking forward to the questions. We've got a lot. Thank you all very much. Adam Yost is going to handle the questions. I'll just leave with this last one, uh, because I think what we're hearing is there needs to be change in leadership. There also needs to be change in the system. Um, and I'll, I'll leave this last question. I'll start it with uh, Ed Hers. You talked about some of the, the leadership issues. In particular, uh, that's not really what you're talking about. But why do you believe that this is a systemic issue, not just a leadership issue, Mr. Hers? And thank you all. I'll see you on the 8th. Adam's going to continue. Thank you, Mike. Uh, the incentives are, are just misaligned. Um, the, the incentive for uh, withholding, for gaming the system, uh, for pushing us into a short squeeze, and, and the incentive to keep, keep new generation off. Uh, it's there. Uh, the lack of reinvestment across the grid has uh, caused us, uh, you know, has brought us to this point. This was obvious. It was you know, well on the way. Um, and, uh, uh, and it's quite clear, you know, from, from Magnus comments that this, this lack of investment in maintaining the grid or, or the resiliency, robustness, uh, ability to, to jump back from a black start, you know, there are other issues here that have not been, uh, uh, highlighted by this failure. Uh, and so we, we need to, uh, uh, really rethink the, the way this, this, this is governed. Uh, it's not an issue of Republicans or Democrats. Uh, it's an issue of taking care of everyone in the state, our, our neighbors, um, the businesses, uh, the economic growth. And, and right now, it's pretty clear we can't do that. Um, and Representative Rosenthal, I have a question for you. There's been a, a lot of um, interest in, in a, having an elected public utilities commission. Um, you know, that's not common in, in most states. Most states do have an appointed commission. So I, I'm curious what in your mind is, is the reason for having them be elected and what that'll, you know, accomplish. So, <clears throat> so first, I, I personally am not actually uh, advocating for or against that position. Uh, I think that's a, a tall hill to climb if you want the governor to sign a bill that takes away his authority to appoint these people. Uh, uh, I suppose the way that you get around that, but um, the notion at least is to make those people accountable to their constituents, to the people of Texas. I think, uh, I think it's a more solid, uh, while that might be nice and it might be helpful, I think a more solid um, solution is to uh, is to require by statute specific regulatory responsibilities, which were, have been suggested. The Public Utility Commission has been lax to um, to even in, to even put in place some of the modest suggestions that came out of that 2011 re report. So I read the whole thing, and some of it is just very nuts and bolts, very simple. There would be ways to implement that. Uh, I have suggested that they set up a, a qualification process. So if you wanna sell energy on the Texas grid, Public Utility Commission puts you through some hoops to make you demonstrate your reliability, let's say. So just the same way any other government vendor would be. But I think, I think we can push them in statute uh, more effectively than trying to get them to be elected positions. Although I'm not opposed to it. Gotcha, that, well, that makes, that makes sense. Um, and we've got about three minutes left. And so I apologize that we're not going to be able to get to most or all of the questions. Um, but one to just see if, if you, you all wanted to go kind of around and just say, you know, if there was one thing that, you know, Texas needs to do to fix this, 
going forward, kind of what would, you know, if, if, if you could just wave the magic wand, you know, what, what would you do? What is the thing that we can, we can do to prevent this from happening in the future? Do you, do you want to start with Professor Hears? Let me kick off. So, you know, we need to change the incentives. Um, you know, the electricity only market is a failure. It was going to be a failure. It is a failure. A monopsonist, you know, buying from, from generators throughout the year, you, you just don't give them a return. And so you wind up with these, these short squeezes, these dislocations. You know, same thing happened in California in 2000. It, we, natural gas going in at Waha at 250, coming out at 1250. Um, I'm going to disagree with, with John on the national grid. Uh, you know, the Western Interconnect had at most six gigawatts of capacity that we could have tapped into, assuming we were connected. We were down 30 gigawatts. Nobody's going to want to connect with us. We would have taken them all down, John. We've got to fix this first, and then maybe, maybe people will invite us to the party. Um, those are the challenges I think we have to have to, to see. And, you know, guys, we're facing a hot summer coming up with, with a much lower reserve margin than, than we've had in past years. Uh, you know, we're, we're close to having, you know, potentially another disaster, only this time it'd be hot and muggy and, and suppose a hurricane rolls in through the south. You know, we've got to be working on, on repairing the nuts and bolts that's going to cost money. It's either going to come from the, the, the right-hand pocket where the consumer pays the bill or the left-hand pocket where the taxpayer does. Um, now, John, you got a lot of work to do. I do. And, uh, and I, I, do, I do want to note that, so I should have also said part, part of my legislation requires we move to a capacity market. And, and also demonstrate, you know, weatherize our systems so that they're more reliable. So those three pieces together go to make it more reliable. You connect to your neighbors, you follow the same rules that they do, you have extra capacity on hand, and your systems are more formidable to begin with. So I, uh, I think it's actually easier than that. Um, I, we have the capacity. Um, in the summertime, we generate over 74 gigawatts of power. Uh, we don't need more capacity. What we need is the second thing you said is weatherization. Um, if a generator bids into the winter market, they must be weatherized. Um, ERCOT, and I'm defending them a little bit here, they were told they had about 30 to 45 uh, gigawatts of power available to them that was not available because it wasn't weatherized. Those generators bid into the ERCOT market uh, representing they were ready to go on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, when they were not. Um, it should be a requirement to be in that market. And finally, about El Paso, um, the ERCOT is connected to the neighbors. We're connected through DC ties rather than AC ties. And my understanding is that during Monday, um, when we first got hit in Sunday night, Mexico actually provided power to the Texas grid until the cold weather hit them and they needed it for themselves. Yeah, I'll just briefly add um, what, what I don't think the solution is and, and that's requiring uh, the PUC commissioners to be appointed. Um, I saw that Terry O'Rourke made the same point that I intend to make here, which is the Railroad Commission, somebody else had asked, how is the Railroad Commission involved in this process? And of course they regulate the fuel suppliers uh, some of whom had compressors that because they weren't winterized failed and that led to no supply getting to the generators who then couldn't fulfill their supply commitments that they had made uh, to ERCOT. And of course, the head of the, you know, all the commissioners of the Railroad Commission are appointed and, and we still don't have true accountability on them. I'll close, with, I'll close with as, you know, the civil lawyer for a county, my thought is to ensure things don't happen in the future, you have to be able to have accountability in the civil courts. Um, so, you know, to the extent that ERCOT is immune or that industry actors are arguing no duty or causation, I mean, you know, I, I think that the courts play an important role in holding folks accountable and letting them know the bounds of acceptable conduct. Uh, and so, you know, I think the court's going to play an important part here in ensuring that this doesn't happen again, or that if it does, that people will be compensated for the harm that they, that they experience. Well, that's great. I, I want to. I want to add a real quick, like 10 or 15 seconds. There's an important question that somebody asked about combating the narrative that green energy caused this. And it's an easy thing to combat. You know, green energy actually performed pretty 
pretty close to what they said they would, 30 gigabytes uh, of, uh, of, sorry, 30 gigawatts of capacity from thermal generation went down and that was the problem. People can say oil and gas power the grid. We were the biggest piece that fell out was the thermal generation. Thank you. I, well, I, I want to thank you all for uh, uh, appearing on our panel. You, you all clearly, you know, have the expertise and the uh, uh, some some great insight. So I appreciate everything you, you offer today. And um, you know, hopefully, maybe we'll have to have a follow up to see later on in the summer to see if we're uh, if we're if we'll be able to fix at least some of these issues. But thank you again, and thank you everyone else for uh, for joining. Um, and we'll. See you for the, the next event, hopefully. Have a good one. Go get him, John. I am on it, brother. Get him, Christian. <laughs>